Okay, so welcome everybody. Here we are. Uh, and boy, it's been a long road, but we're just about there. Chapter 14, finishing up the book, getting there. And, and this next chapter, Prototypes, is one of the most interesting. Uh, maybe one of the trickier ones, uh, but once you get it, you once you get it, you have a real uh, set of capabilities in your hands that, that can make a big difference in how you think about X3D, how you use X3D, most importantly, how you extend X3D. So let's get into that. Uh, prototype nodes. So what we have in here are the different parts that make up prototypes for their usage and uh, for uh, uh, their construction. So first is construction. We have uh, Proto declare that proto declare the declaration of a prototype uses uh, a proto interface and a proto body, and it also uses field declarations inside the proto interface. Okay, now once we've defined a proto, we can further fine-tune it by taking the interfaces at the top of the proto and connecting them directly to fields inside the proto. We don't use routes to get in and out of the proto. We can use routes internally, but we use a thing called is. Is and connect are our two constructs used to uh, uh, say this field is the same and is connected to an external interface. Okay? That helps us define then, these two steps help us define the construction of the prototype. And then uh, extern proto declare is what we employ for reuse. Okay, you can copy and paste prototypes, it's just X3D after all, but we find it's uh, a lot more efficient sometimes to get it right once and have it correct in that one place, and then extern proto declare lets us point to it and grab that proto. Okay? Now, you can declare all day long, but if you're not using it, what's the point? So, uh, proto instance is how we actually create an instance of that prototype. Make an actual copy that will render, that will be seen in the scene, and uh, can also be initialized using the field value tag to customize the application of this prototype, to take advantage of that extensibility. And then we finish up with uh, a bunch of examples. And there are many, many examples. I hope you get to the point where you're taking these examples and twisting and turning them and bending them into your own examples, making your own prototypes, your own extensions to X3D. Okay, so let's, uh, let's begin. The primary motivation for prototypes is extensibility. And uh, lest we forget, it is capital E. <laughs> Oops, back, get back there. We do capital X3D, capitalize the E, but the X is extensible. And so the idea here is you can create your own nodes you can define a full-fledged first-class first-class new construct in the language that you define and you use and can share with others. Now if you've done any programming before you'll know mm, that's kind of unusual uh, that you get to work right at the language level. Uh, certainly other languages have extension capabilities such as creating uh, software libraries, functions, and, and subroutines, and procedures, and so forth, class hierarchies, etc. But in X3D, we get to not only create new functionality, but apply it as if it's an actual node in the language. So this is pretty powerful. And this is designed not just for individual authors, who are trying to make a more efficient way, a better cookie cutter, a better cookie to stamp out, but also uh, for specification designers. When we conceptualize, when people have a good idea about, gee, the language ought to have this new capability, 
one of the first places we'll go is to prototypes to say, well, let's block this out. Let's see what it looks like. Let's try it. Let's try to repeat it. Let's see if it actually works or not. And then, given that it should work, and then we get some experience with it, then people can say, okay, we've got some usage experience now. We see how it works in the scene. Given that experience, we'll consider promoting it to a first class node in the language, a formally defined node in the language. Okay, what else? Uh, uh, there are other extensibility mechanisms available besides prototypes. So I'm not trying to have a contest here, but certainly want to point them out. And, and you can use these in combination with prototypes. Uh, internally or externally or however it makes sense because the whole language is at our disposal here. So getting clear about the value of each is important. And the primary two nodes and I think are, are worth mentioning are first of all inline and secondly script. So what does the inline node do? Well it lets us pull in other scenes on a document by document basis. And if we use something the book only talks about a little bit, uh, but if we use the notion of import, export, let's get my spell checker here. Import, export together with inline allow the routing of events from one scene to another into or out of one to another. So that's pretty good. That lets us add more stuff to our scene. But it doesn't necessarily give us the degree of customization we might want, where we say, well, the existing nodes are okay, but they, they don't quite do what I want to do. Let me add something new. Okay, so this is where inline falls short. Customization. What else can we do? Well, script nodes are important because we do get to add functionality. We can write whatever functions we want and expose them with fields that take events in, that produce events out, so we can get that imperative programming of a script cross-connected with the declarative response of the scene. Okay, so sky's the limit there in terms of what transfer functions you can define but you're still limited with a script to exist just within that scene. It, you have to be copied one at a time if you want to reuse it. Uh, at least the script node would. The script code can be external. But the script node would still have to be there and deft so that you can route events into and out of it. So these are both important, but we can do more. And that's what the prototypes are all about. And so full-fledged X3D nodes, that means if we want a better grouping node or a better material node or some new node that can fit in with the other ones, this gives us a chance to define it. And the whole key to this is when we build prototypes are not that, hello, we've got a brand new elephant we're bringing to the uh, chicken coop uh, there were a, a whole box of oranges to, to bring into the crate of apples. We're not mismatching them. Rather, each prototype is defined using already existing x 3 d nodes. And that's why it can directly be embedded in the language. This is why our new nodes, as long as they stick with the x 3 d palette, combine them in new ways, can be efficiently implemented at runtime and we get all the power and performance of X3D, plus the extensibility of what we want without any downside of uh, recompiling or refiguring out, because prototypes are just more X3D. Okay, so let's, uh, let's work our way into some of these details. So first, let's look a little harder at the inline node. Uh, certainly, inline node is easy to create. How do you create an inline node? Well, you start with, I've got an X3D scene. Oh, what, what could be easier? You already have the scene. And simply say, I'd like to reuse it, or I'd like to bring it here, include it, stick it into some other larger scene. Okay, great. The inline node simply refers to that by a URL, 
and brings it in. So couldn't be easier uh, in terms of uh, how do we use it. But the flexibility is still lacking. When you inline that node, what you got is what you get. Okay, it's just going to come in at, as is and get positioned, maybe rotated and even scaled to where you tell it to based on the parents of that inline node, but that's where it is. And there's no customization of it. So if, if you're bringing in a red ball and you want it to be a blue ball, even something as simple as that, there's no way to tell the inline, uh, I would like you to be different. We do have the import-export mechanism, though, which, which is valuable. So you might say at runtime, well, if I can make my scene color aware, then maybe I'll stick a script in there that changes the color of the ball. So if I then export that script node from the child scene, that would let the parent scene import it and say, I can route event to that node, and it's shared, and it will go into the lower one. Okay, so how this would look would be something like this. We'd have a shared node that's uh, imported, and uh, the bottom scene would export that node, and the parent scene. would import it, and then, given that state of affairs, we could route values in, and they would come out and pass from one scene to the other. Or vice versa, you could route values up. and they would come back out in the parent scene. Okay, that's different than customizing it. That's an event passing, state value passing mechanism. And a little bit complicated. So let's look at what prototypes give us in comparison. Uh, the primary value of a prototype in this respect is initialization values. Prototypes define a new set of nodes. They give it a single node's name. And they also have some interfaces, some fields. So when we create a new copy of that prototype each time, we're able to reinitialize those uh, parameters quite easily. So this is where you say, well, if I want a ball, and I just want to say, give me a new ball, and I'm going to expose the color, then we could have our new ball with a field value of red, and another new ball with a field value of blue, another new ball with a field value of green. Prototypes are preferred when you need that kind of reinitialization. Okay. So, before we drill down too far into the details, let's review this summary then of the functionality. Uh, a prototype uh, creates a new node. And in fact, maybe we should rewrite this first statement to be singular. Each prototype creates a new full-fledged node. And here's an even better way to fix that spelling. Given that each definition of a prototype, each declaration of it, includes field definitions, just like a regular X3D node has its fields, our prototype can have fields. Those field definitions allow you to define the signature, if you will, of what that node looks like, what its initialization parameters are, what its outputs, what its inputs might be. So, um, very powerful. It really is a node redefinition capability. So we are extending the first class constructs of the language. Once you have that declared, defining the node, then we use proto instance 
as a way to say, okay, here's a copy. Reuse it once, reuse it twice, reuse it as many times as you like. Okay. Now, uh, most often when we're testing, uh, we will just do it all within one big scene. We'll define a few prototypes, and then we'll have multiple proto instances taking advantage of them. But once you get good at it, or once you create a prototype that really is a time saver, really is a helpful piece of new functionality, you'll probably find yourself wanting to use it again. Okay, so how do we do that reuse? We use extern proto declare, and that looks almost like the top of a proto declare in that it gives the name of the proto and it lists the fields. But it also gives a URL where it says, I'm not going to tell you all the rest. Go to this URL and pull it out of the file where it's defined already. And that way I can just take advantage of that prototype without having to redo or duplicate or possibly break any existing work. Okay, so let's get clear on some of the terminology. I've used these words a few times already. Let's make sure we've got it nailed down. A declaration versus an instance. Okay, now the declaration is the definition of what does it look like. The instance is the actual copy. If we were using uh, object-oriented terminology, then uh, you might look at this. Uh, is the declaration would be the uh, source or the class and the instance would be the actual object that's created, we sometimes say instantiated, at runtime. Okay, so exact same type of notion here, definition versus creation. So cookie cutters are a very good way then to consider this, uh, a simple way to show uh, what's going on. And so the proto-declaration proto therefore is our template where we define all the functionality and the uh, instances are the actual copies that are stamped out, maybe with some customization, but copies stamped out nevertheless at runtime for us to use. Okay, So that's important to remember because if the proto declare is that definition, and if the definition is uh, doesn't create a new node, that I think we could safely say then that proto declare does not render. You won't see it if you define it in the scene. You might have a hundred lines of uh, X3D there describing this wonderful new capability. And then when you hit run and put it in the browser, when you, when you try to view it, there won't be anything there. Because it is just a definition. So to view that thing, that means you need the prototype instance. So that means not only will I copy the new node, but it will make it visible. So here's a summary of that structure, which we've just uh, verbally laid out on the last few slides. Okay, and this is how we construct these, uh, these guys. So the proto-declare includes a proto-interface, which in turn includes a field, one or more field definitions. So uh, I'll put the count here. You might have no proto-interface, or you might have one, and you can have zero or more. Uh, fields. Proto body, you must have one. And uh, the is connect links are optional, but you can have as many as you want. Okay. You must have an initial node, or there's nothing that your extension is uh, taking advantage of. And additional nodes, sure, typically, but there's no requirement of that. Okay. So uh, we can also see on the right-hand side the 
very brief definitions of what each does. And uh, I think it's important to point out at this point uh, for these terms uh, that this is, uh, these terms are peculiar or unique to X3D, the XML syntax, the .X3D files. dot x3d files which are in XML syntax. Okay, the exact same cons constructs do exist in the classic Vermal construct, classic Vermal syntax, but they have slightly different keywords and so I think it's much better to learn it one way first and then see how it maps out into uh, Vermal thermal syntax, and you'll probably find it more understandable that way. Um, so the functionality is identical. Don't let me uh, give you the wrong impression there, but the jargon, the terminology here is uh, the X3D terminology because we use it a little bit differently. Okay, so proto-declare is our primary definition. External proto-declare is for reuse. And uh, proto instance is for creating copies. And we'll see uh, one interesting contrast is the tag field versus field value. And those are similar, but not quite the same. And the primary difference is, is listed here, the field defines each field interface. So in other words, we will name it, we will give it a type, we will even give it an access type, whether it's input only, output only, input, output, or initialize only. So we'll have that type and access type. We'll also have, if appropriate, an initial value in the field. The field value definition, on the other hand, is much simpler. All we have to do is say, well, we know about that field. We know about that customization capability. So I'll just give you the name of the field and I'll give you a new initialization value. And you can just use that to your X3D browser at runtime to give me a customized copy when you first create my prototype instance. Okay, so there's the box score summary, I guess we could say, the overview of how this thing's put together. It's, it's worth paying attention that it is a powerful capability. Uh, and uh, I hope you remember that. You know, when you're, when you're draining the swamp, it's, it's kind of hard to remember while you're fighting alligators that, uh, gee, a nice drained, beautiful field when you're all done is what you're looking for. So let me offer this as some motivation. There are very few languages that are extensible enough to enable authors to write changes to the language itself. So uh, this is powerful. It's been said before, in, in just not just in programming, but in general, that you can't think that your ability to express ideas is constrained by the vocabulary of your language. In fact, it's even been conjectured that your ability to think new thoughts may be constrained by the vocabulary and the concepts that you already have. I'm not trying to call anybody smarter than anybody else. I'm just pointing out that having concepts, having the ability to put terms together in different ways may lead to thoughts that weren't possible before just because they couldn't be expressed precisely or with sufficient clarity to make sense. So if we think that, mm, yeah, I guess vocabulary and concepts are important, then, wow, this is pretty cool that authors could have the tools right in hand to be just as smart as all those good people who help put the extensible 3D graphics specification together. It's a, it's, a, it's a powerful capability you're getting handed here. 
So uh, uh, that's good. Let's let's take advantage. Okay, now let's just say a few more things about prototypes in this lesson to see how they make sense. One theme that uh, has come back to us again and again uh, as we've studied X3D is the notion of strong typing. Typing as in data types. Typing as in it must fit. You can only put a square peg into a square hole and not a square peg into a round hole. It's the, it's the notion that if I have a color value, I must give it an RGB array of three floating point numbers, each ranging zero to one. That's my floating, that's my color type. I can't give it a HTML color type because those numbers range from zero to 255. I can't give it the word blue or green as a string because those aren't allowed. They're not part of the X3D data type. Okay? So just as we have that kind of typing for simple fields, integers, floats, booleans, strings, all carefully kept segregated and split and properly hooked up. We have a similar relationship for parent-child nodes within the scene graph. Okay, well, whenever we have a group node, we can put most of the nodes in of X3D as children nodes in there. They're allowed, in fact, defined as children nodes, but we can't put them all there. For example, when you have a shape, you can only put an appearance and some geometry in that. And once you have an appearance, you can only put a material and textures and that, so on and so forth in that. So that structure is actually data typing. It's node typing. It's the same as conversely why we can't put a material next to a grouping node or inside a grouping node because it doesn't make any sense. It's not a groupable children node. A, mater a, a material has to be inside the context of appearance, which in turn is inside the context of shape, associating appearance to geometry. This is why it's so carefully constructed. Now that strong data typing is not just because people want to say, I told you so and we want you to do it this way. No, it's, it's actually very pragmatic because when information goes down to the graphics card, it has to be structured a certain way to render efficiently and quickly. So we've imposed these constraints, we've imposed the structure on the language so that it is sensible. Similarly, we don't want users at runtime getting asked, pick a number from 0 to 10, and they say turquoise. All right. If we had loose typing of routes, you could set that up without an error and it would make no sense at runtime. So because we want X3D to work, we want scenes to make sense, we have strong typing of data and we have strong typing of nodes where they go together. So given that refresher, that review of, of how X3D is put together, we should say, oh, oh, okay, if prototypes really are an extension of X3D there with the emphasis on we're extending, not reinventing evolution, not revolution, then it would make sense that prototypes should follow the same rules as every other node in X3D. Okay, and I'm sorry if that appears inconvenient, but if we change our points of view from, gee, I want to do anything to how would a browser implement that? The reason most languages aren't extensible is because the software says, I don't know how to do that because you're telling me something that literally I don't know how to do. You've extended me. It's different. Okay, so we've been very deliberate. We maintain simple data types. We maintain no data typing. We're very strict about it because then the browser software where the rubber hits the road of how do we make this work, 
browser software could say, oh, prototype. Oh, you're just giving me more X3D here. You're just giving me a bunch of nodes that fit together properly, and I'm going to make a cookie cutter out of it so that it's more X3D, it's more X3D. Uh, and I already know how to do X3D, so if you give me more X3D that's like the existing X3D, then I know what to do with that too. Okay, so here we are. Strong typing of nodes, the same story as everything else we've done. Okay, so where does this really play out now? In the first node of the prototype body, and write it right there, it's the first node. That's primary. It defines the type. Okay? So when a browser is reading your prototype and says, hmm, what new node am I creating now? It will say, well, whatever's first in here, that's what it looks like. And it might have all sorts of extra baggage and functionality attached on it. But that very first one is this primary signature, the primary functionality of this prototype. So it goes, ah, okay. So if you now ask the browser, how do you follow strong typing? Where would you put this prototype? The browser says, oh, that's easy. I just look at the first node. And whatever that is, that has rules associated with it. So if the first node in there is a transform, then I can put it anywhere I might put a transform. If my first node is a material node, then I could put it anywhere there's a material in it, but nowhere else. Okay, so this first node is what's so important, and this is why our prototypes are in evolution, because we said, we'll pick an existing node and we'll give it some new additional functionality, or, or maybe even some restricted functionality, but it looks a lot like that original node definition, and now the browser knows where to put it. Okay? Now, there, as you might expect, this extensibility is both powerful and carefully defined. So when we do that, we said, oh, okay, great. So the browser knows where to put it. Our strong typing of our prototype matches that first node. But let's say that first node is a transform node. There might be lots of stuff in it. That's okay. That's fine. In fact, that's part of the value. We can extend that first node. However, the rules are still in play. It must be valid. So it must be that when you, even if that first node has children nodes in it, those all have to be internally consistent. It had to be a valid subchunk of X3D, meaning you could probably copy it, cut it, paste it, put it elsewhere on the scene, and it would just work. Okay, because we're taking something that works and wrapping an interface around it to find the now here's a curiosity. This is where prototypes do differ from the rest of the scene, is that once we have that first node, which is so important, to define the type, we can add extra nodes right after that as siblings, follow-on peers, and we can stick anything we want in there. The gotcha is they don't render. They're not drawn. Why? Because the first one is what matters in the scene graph. The first one defines where can my prototype fit in the regular scene. The rest of the stuff is just sort of baggage that it carries along. Maybe has extra functionality like animation. There might be an interpolator. There might be some routes in there. There might be a script. Half the time those don't render anyway, so being invisible is no handicap for them. But they're carried there with that, and you could think of it as maybe the, uh, the uh, reinforcements behind that node that help make it functionality. Okay, now this combination of rules gives us then flexibility, because we can add nodes to that first node to give it more capability, but it also gives us consistency, meaning we remain strongly typed that we have a node that makes sense in the context of the rest of the X3D scene graph, 
and frankly, that we can discover errors. Discoverable before runtime, okay? Uh, uh, that's a good thing. Let's draw a better happy face here. A uh, little bit. Because uh, getting rid of those errors before they appear to the user is, of course, the goal to high quality scenes. Now, here's a repeat on our syntax alert. Uh, there is a slight difference between the XML syntax and the classic verbal, but they are almost, they, functionally, they are identical. There's nothing you can do in one that you can't do in the other. They're interchangeable and translatable, round tripable even. Uh, so they do say the same thing. This is consistent with X3D being the abstract definition matches each encoded. So, but it's worth uh, a little yellow flag right here, because if you're used to one syntax versus the other, maybe you're a Vermal programmer, Vermal author, then check the book. We do give side-by-side -side comparisons of each syntax. I'm going to stick with the XML syntax in this chapter. Okay, so we've gotten through the basic concepts of what a uh, prototype is about. Um, this is maybe uh, less of a summary and more of a functional uh, overview. So in the next section, we'll uh, start getting into the specific details of how do I build my proto-declare? What are the pieces inside of that? Then how do I refer to it in external proto? And how do I use it as a proto instance at runtime? Okay, see you then.